um well we did oh recording in progress okay sorry i did it i joined to join from a secondary laptop keep going okay okay i don't know if i if i should start again <laughs> but, uh, that's for, for okay. okay yeah <laughs> I think we can we can start here and thank you, Sophia, for starting the recording. Um, today's chaos meeting is um, with Miguel from Metergia, and we've already started, so um, we'll we'll have you continue. Okay, okay. Maybe. So thank you, thank you for this. Yes, I was gonna say maybe just like a very brief summary of like how you got to this slide. Like <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so really, really quick. My name is Miguel Angel Fernandez. I'm I'm from Vitergia. Okay, and I'm, I'm the, the scientist. And my role at Vitergia is uh, the data analyst and consultant. And we are talking about uh, risk in open source. Um, so we are dealing with the problem of okay, we know that a lot of, uh, well, most of the companies. Uh, one of the most common problems that companies are facing nowadays is how to assess the risk um, from using OSS libraries in their technological stack, okay? And we are talking about, okay, what's the definition of this risk and which risks uh, could we facing, okay? So this is how we uh, got to this slide. So let me, let me uh, keep explaining what I was saying and then we'll, we can continue uh, and give more context. So, <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll resume it from here. So as I was saying, um, Vitergia is using an uh, open source tool, which is called Grimoire Lab, to analyze open source projects. But we are not analyzing the, the code itself. So we are not looking at vulnerabilities in the code. So um, while we're talking, when we are talking about risk here, I want to put the focus on the unknown vulnerabilities. So those that we don't know about yet, we can think about some famous examples like Log4j or XYZ libraries and what happened and so on. So we are talking about this kind of unknown vulnerabilities that are yet to come and also maintenance issues. So the idea is to tackle the problem um, by having a risk model to analyze these open source dependencies and assess the risk, but not from a code perspective, but from a socio-technical perspective. I mean, instead of looking at code vulnerabilities, we look at the activity and the sustainability of the open source projects behind these dependencies. So this is the, this is the idea behind the, the risk model we are proposing. Um, why is this important? We say that 96% of the code base out there contains open source, but also there are some uh, research papers claiming that uh, these systems uh, having outdated dependencies are four times more um, likely to have security issues as opposed to that that are updated. So uh, identifying this um, outdated dependencies is really important to, to tackle the risk in an early stage. And I want to put the focus on this uh, cartoon that we really like, <laughs> which is uh, basically um, this is the infrastructure of any technological stack uh, from any company or any big project. And, and the risk model tries to identify these kind of pieces, the kind of weak, weaker components in our dependency trees. And this is something, uh, this is a, a, a cartoon from um, XKCD. Okay, so this is uh, the credit for, for, for them. And we try to, um, well, to identify these weaker components. Okay, and how are we doing this? So let me explain more. We are getting more into the technical part and then the data part. So the idea is that um, we get an application or many different applications. We call that software components in this slide, right? And from these software components, we have dependencies. So in, in each of the software components we have in our technological stack, we can have uh, many dependencies. And each dependency can be found in one or more software components. So the idea is to analyze 
the risk for each of the dependencies and assign to them a risk score. In this case, between zero and 10, where zero is the lower risk and, the, and 10 is the higher risk, okay? Um, so the idea is not only having this score for each dependency, but also we can have the information of how many software components are affected by this dependency. So you can have a medium risk, uh, for instance, this medium risk dependency that is affecting only one software component, but here, for instance, dependency D, we have a high risk, 9.1 out of 10, but this is affecting to all software components. So this model um, tries to um, give the score and, and represent the, the risk in a way that you can quickly identify these cases, okay? That these dependencies that may require some attention, okay? So how, how are we doing this, basically? Um, from the software components, we use uh, some tools to extract the software bill of materials, okay? And from this data, from the software bill of materials, we can obtain the dependencies from the software components, okay? What we need in our case, are the repositories behind these dependencies, okay? So we use Visual Analytics Platform, which is based on Grimoire Lab. You know that Grimoire Lab is a chaos project. You can go there and, and check it out. Um, so we analyze activity, we analyze commits, GitHub issues and GitHub pull requests, okay? And from this data, from this activity, we produce the risk analysis for these dependencies, okay? How are we doing this? Once we have the data, as I was saying, for commits, issues, and pull requests for each dependency we want to analyze, we compute a set of metrics, okay? Uh, in this case, we are getting, we are computing metrics related, as I was saying before, with sustainability. Um, so we look at things like how much time does it take to um, close issues and pull requests? So this uh, is giving us a measure um, of how much time it requires to solve things and also maybe can point out point out if the project uh, has enough resources maybe to to answer all the questions or to solve all the issues or to to review all the contributions okay we have also the backlog management index and review efficiency index um, these are also measures for both issues and and pull requests or code reviews in the sense of um, the backlog that gets accumulated, okay, and see if the, the project is able to solve this in a, in a good pace. Also, we have the pony factor, which is looking at how many people are responsible for 50% of the code base. So having this measure, we can learn how dependent is the project on a few set of people or a large group of people, so it depends also, we have retention rate, which is comparing newcomers to the to the project and also people getting inactive in the project. And we also are looking at the growth of active contributors. We see how many active contributors the project has, and we compare different periods to see the evolution. So we compute these metrics. By the way, I tried to include some links to I think equivalent metrics in chaos, defining chaos. Okay, so uh, this lead time for issues in, in chaos uh, website, you can see that as issue resolution duration, for instance. So it may it may have different namings, but the metrics are really uh, similar. For instance, for the review efficiency index, there is a metric in chaos, which is uh, change request closure ratio. Okay, so this is another, another way to, to name this. Okay, and so on. So computing these metrics for each dependency, each of the dependencies, we get a total risk score between zero and 10. And we assign, we, we convert this number to our, our risk uh, category, low, medium, high, or very high. And by doing this, we can have representations like this. Uh, we have in this in this chart the number of dependencies and the distribution according to the total risk score. Okay, so we can quickly identify how many high risk dependencies 
um, our software components uh, have in this case. Also with some more data, we could have this information also split by the package manager for each dependency and also learn how many uh, software components are affected by, by these uh, dependencies. Of course, uh, we can focus on the high risk dependencies and see what's, what's going on. Miguel, I had a question for you. Yes. You said that, um, I think two slides back, that yes. if that dependency is being used in different software components, um, then it has a higher risk score, but then how do you take use that as a metric? What metric is that? That's a good question. Uh, thank you for the question. So the, the risk score is not having into account how many components are affected because this is depending on the software component you're analyzing. Okay, okay. I see, yeah. But I guess. Uh, what I was saying is that this, this risk score can be complemented with the information of how many software components are affected by by this dependency. Okay, but it would be a way, I mean, uh, this question would be, is the number of software components needs to be part of, of the result? So this is this is interesting. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think Kelly has her hands right. Yes, right. please, go ahead. Yeah, it's for two slides ahead of here. Okay. Um, I was gonna ask here? Yeah. Um, yeah. What what is lead time? Okay, so lead time is defined as the time it takes since, um, in this case for issues, okay, it would be the time since the issue creation until the issue resolution. So you get this this time, in this case, we are measuring that in days. Oh, so how, how many days does it take to close the issues? So we measure that for all the issues and we compute the median of this value. So when we get a, a value for this metric, we know um, how much time does it take to close at least half of the issues. Okay. Um, okay. And then for, how do you take into account issues that aren't closed? This is a good question. So you can uh, take the approach in two different ways. So if the issue is not closed yet, uh, you can measure the time until the, so since the issue creation until the current time. So you measure this, this delta, okay? But right now, what we are doing, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, is taking only the issues and code reviews that have been closed. So we know that, um, we know how many days it took to close. Okay, and so, how would you take into account like the I guess that would go into like the backlog management index of like all of the ones that aren't and what does that entail? Yeah, so yeah, that's correct. In order to take into account the number of items that are not closed, uh, this is what this index is giving us. So the idea, the, the ideal scenario that is never going to happen, okay, is that you uh, close then same number of items that you open. Okay, so in this case, the ratio of the index will be one. So this is this is something that is not going to happen. Uh, okay, because this, this would mean this could mean that you don't have any activity also, because if you don't have closing issues and you don't have new issues, so you don't have any issues at all, right? So the idea is to look at how imbalanced are these two numbers and to see this ratio. So I would say um, uh, what we are trying to assess here is how different these two numbers are. If you are creating a lot of issues, but you are not closing a similar number of issues, then your backlog is going to, to grow. And if this keeps growing uh, for a long period of time, you're going to have a problem. So there are metrics, it's true, there are metrics that can point out problems that are happening are happening right now in the project, in the repository, like the median time for issues or median time for pull requests is something that points out something is happening right now. This is what it takes to solve things right now. But there are some metrics like the backlog management index or review efficiency index that um, are pointing out a situation that could get worse in the future or that could cause problems in the future. 
Okay, maybe it's not immediate, but if you see that the backlog is growing and you don't um, you don't take action, you don't do anything, maybe in the future this will this is going to be a, a problem and it's going to lead to a, a greater a bigger lead time to solve things, right? Because maybe you don't have enough resources, because maybe it takes more time to close uh, all the other things, this kind of, or maybe you have to make some policy for house cleaning in your, your project. Maybe there are other issues that are not making any sense right now. These kind of things we, we usually find when we when we look at these kind of projects, right? So this is kind of the, the idea. And this, this at least for issues and pull requests, and, and the three metrics below are more uh, focused in code contributions in commits. Yeah. In this case. Have y'all considered looking at this from like a um, survival analysis angle, like looking at it, like issues and pull requests from like that perspective? Um, we didn't consider that yet. Uh, we are in the, I mean, we have done this uh, for one big customer. And mm -hmm. what we are doing right now is to uh, adjust the model by analyzing um the dependencies from from big projects uh, in in different ecosystems, and and see that uh, all the results and and all the tuning and so on make sense. Basically, that uh, when we accept, when we um, are giving a dependency a score, this score is make is making sense or looking at the project activity, right? Um, so right now we are focusing on on that rather than considering different metrics. But for sure, it is something we are considering to have more metrics into account. And there is also another discussion, which is should these metrics um, be equally important? Right now they are, but um, you could say, well, maybe for me, uh, it's not that important that I have newcomers and and so on. Uh, it's it's more important to solve things on time. So so this yeah. is something that you could do. That makes sense. That's something that I've learned from a data scientist over at the Ansible project of looking of like since there is so many like how do you take into account the like issues that are indefinitely open and like with the survival analysis being a decent solution for for that like to be able to still take those things into a consideration yeah it's a it's a good it's a good uh, a good thing to look at i i, I would have a, a look for sure and um yeah also when we're talking about retention we are also having some discussions on how to compute this this retention mm -hmm. and so on and this is something related to demographics in terms of community and, and so on. There are metrics in chaos that are really interesting for, for that too. And but yeah, this is this is something really important. Yeah, it's actually it's a really interesting point, Kelly, because I, I also have thought a lot about like project specific norms and baselines and how we can use those within our own analysis to your example of how Ansible treats certain things. I looked at a lot of Kubernetes things and the way that they use their automation also throws off a lot of traditional metrics um, because of auto close features. So knowing that context changes how, what metrics are effective and how you even interpret the metric. So uh, Miguel, I'm, I'm curious how, how you're going to record that information. Like I have one of those things where like I, I, I allowed the approach to try to create something that's more of a, a standard model that can be flexible. Let's say you change the weightings per project. Um, mm -hmm. But noting that there, like we might have to, you might have to come up with a list of like, what are the additional considerations when you wait for your project? Like how many people are in your community? How are you using automation? How are specific policies going to change the importance of some of these metrics or the validity of some of these metrics? Um, is, is you like, I'm not really sure how you would communicate that, um, but I'm assuming, like I'm, I'm curious if you're thinking about that either in the way that the tool is implementing the solution or would that be something you would explain in documentation or some sort of way to like annotate per project? Yes, this is this is a this is an important point. Um, we had this discussion because when we establish, uh, let's say, uh, all these metrics values to see, okay, where in which risk level falls each of the values and so on, this is also, depending on each community and each project, they have their own policies and so on, and maybe uh, something bad or a, a bad result in a metric doesn't mean that the risk is high. But the idea is that um, 
at least you have something that points out that requires your attention. Maybe it's, it's totally fine, but at least there's something that it's worth uh, looking at and, and reviewing what's going on. Maybe the project decided to move the issue management to another tool, and this is why we have a huge uh, media lead time to solve issues because they are not in here anymore. But what we have uh, seen is that uh, these values also are very dependent on the kind of dependencies in terms of package managers and languages. So it's not the same looking at uh, Golang packages, of Golang dependencies and NPM dependencies, for instance. NPM dependencies are, uh, I think, uh, really distinct from other kind of dependencies. They tend to be smaller in size and their dynamics are different. So um, it's a compromise between being flexible and, and give each metric its importance. But also I think if uh, you give this flexibility, what you lose is the possibility to compare, to compare projects. So I think it is a hard decision. For now, we uh, the approach we are taking is to not give any weight to the metrics in the sense of uh, you can do that, but I think that compromises the thing of comparing things. So it could be adjusted for sure. Uh, but right now, in order to have more, um, how, how can I say this? How can I put this? More consistent results, I would say, because we are looking at different dependencies from many different projects in, in different contexts, right? To make sure that this makes sense. At least uh, we need to have this baseline to where to to start to start with at least. So I don't know if this solves the question or I <laughs> rounded a bit <laughs> for the answer. <laughs> okay, so I was saying that uh, having this uh, risk scores uh, allow us to to have this uh, kind of representations where we can see how the risk is distributed in terms of number of dependencies and if we have extra information on the dependent on the software components and the dependencies we are obtaining from the from the S-bombs, we could visualize also how many of these dependencies belong to its package manager or to its language. This is something really interesting to see when information is available. I think it it, it makes a really uh, nice um, visualization and you can get interesting insights from from it. Also, um, there are some examples here, uh, just some some random examples out of the some sample analysis we we made. Okay, so these are four dependencies and the risk value. So there is one for each each of the risk value and the risk score. So if we if we look at the, this one, okay, so this got really very high risk, and we we get into this. It's true that it doesn't have many, many commits, but we see that uh, last commit was submitted last year. So it seems, it seems like the activity is not that high lately. Maybe it's not a problem, as I was saying, maybe this is not a problem, but at least we, uh, we know that, uh, well, maybe this project is not that maintained anymore. So maybe it's worth, it's worth it to, to have a look at least, right? Uh, we have this Kubernetes API, for instance, we have Medium. Uh, we can have in the model why the model assessed uh, this Medium results. So you can have individual results for each of the metrics. Uh, this one has a lot of comments. Uh, so a lot of issues, uh, pull request. Now they have only three issues open, one pull request. Uh, but you can see that, um, for instance, in this case, the high risk, this high risk, um, Dependency, okay, it is used by 27k projects, almost. So um, the idea is to point out this kind of this kind of dependencies or this kind of projects that is worth it to have a look and see what's going on. And we can say, okay, we are we are okay with it, but at least we know. Um, yeah, so that's the that was the idea for today. So sorry if this took longer than than expected previously i was no i didn't want to hijack the, the meeting <laughs> and the conversation and, and thank you for the questions and i'm glad to to keep discussing about this
I thought this was great. And there's a lot of things in there that um, I didn't realize you all were doing at Perturgia. Um, oh, what is um, your team's next step with this? Are you um, starting to build out um, more metrics? Are you trying to just um, do more, apply this to more projects? What is the idea behind it? Yeah, the idea is keep um, keep checking uh, the results of the model and checking that with more projects and more dependencies in, in different contexts and see how the model behaves. Also, we would like to add some more options to the model. For instance, if you have checked one dependency that has high risk, but you're okay with that risk, maybe it's a good way to say, okay, it's a high risk, but I already know this. This is this is something I, I already checked, okay? Also, we are looking at uh, how we could um, visualize this information better and how this information can be consumed. So, and also there are some metrics that may be part of, of the analysis, metrics that um, involve um, organizations and, and how organizations contribute to, to these projects. But this is something uh, we need to we need to discuss. We need to see uh, how much information uh, it is provides, and of course the the part of the weights and so on is also a discussion a discussion that is taking place. So um, this are, this is basically what we are working on. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Well, Miguel, I think we're um, just at time. Um, I really appreciate you coming to our group and um, to, and presenting this and sharing um, sharing um, this information with us. I think it'd actually be really helpful um, to have you come back another time and present, um, whether it's to this group or even the OSPO group. I think there's some um, thoughts there um, and thinking through a lot of the viability metrics as well that that group's um, been talking about. For sure, it will be my pleasure. So thank you, thank you for having me, and thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to to be here with you all. So really nice to see you all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So Sophia, I don't know how this works. If I if the recording <laughs> if the recording ends and then do we do I have to do anything? <laughs> No, I selected upload to the cloud or else it was going to go to my laptop. So okay. I just pinged Elizabeth to let her know that that's what I selected because I assume that's how it works. If not, then it's going to end up in the ether. But I, I don't think so. Like I have to imagine that or else we'd have 10 different people with Zoom recordings of chaos meetings. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so much for recording. it. I really appreciate it. You like figuring it all out. <laughs> it's been a weird day, but I'm glad it worked out. Uh, yeah. A little bit of a sidebar, I have an intern on my team that's been working on some stuff that I think would be interesting for this group, but I think would need like a good, probably like elite, like 20 to 30 minute time block to let him present. And I'd like people to get his feedback or get y'all's feedback. So I don't know if the next meeting is what makes, or I just wanted to try to get an idea to start scheduling for I can tell him to come. Yeah, whenever... Put it on the agenda whenever you whenever you all are ready. Feel free to yeah. uh, let me and Don know. We'll just throw it on there. Um, just a reminder that chaos meetings are going to be paused for the next two weeks. I think fifth through the sixteenth. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just for so summer be, break. Okay, so it would be the twenty eighth. Would be the first. Would be the yeah. next one. Okay, that would be the next one. But then I think that is the week before the Labor Day holiday. So I'll check in with Elizabeth to see if she if they're still keeping it or not. So I'll let you okay. know. Yeah, just let me know. That'd be great. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great August break and we'll catch up over Slack. Great. Sure, you too. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Cool out there. <laughs> thank you.